I remember sitting in the careers advisory office in high school and being asked what I wanted to do when I finished school. And I said, I want to go to Hollywood. And they were like, okay, cool, what's your backup? And I said, I don't have one. I just had this sort of naive obsession about it. Hello, I'm Chris Hemsworth, and this is the timeline of my career. I see. Excuse me, who are you? He's our new vet, Dr. Whiteside. Where's Dr. Martin? He usually fills in for Dr. Judy when she's away. Dr. Martin is at a conference. Excuse me. The first thing I did was called The Saddle Club, and it was a, a, a TV show about a community of, of horse riding young kids. And I came in as a vet, because uh, there was a horse with an injury. And I must have been 18, 19, so I don't know how I was a qualified vet at that point, but uh, you know, creative license and all that. And I came in and I was so terrified. And you can see, you can hear my voice is kind of way up here. Everything's tense and I'm, I'm flushed red. And I just remembered like that was an out of body experience, that whole shoot, because I was just terrified. It's the first time I had to speak on camera. What happened? Fell sick and it's just collapsed from exhaustion. Look, I stand by my opinion, okay? There's nothing wrong with this horse. And I remember going home and saying to my mum, that's it, my career's over. She said, you don't really have a career to have finished yet. What are you talking about? And I said, my future career, the one I've imagined is, is not gonna happen. Cause I, I, I remember telling my mum, I said, the show gets shown in Canada and Canada's close to America, which is Hollywood. So they're gonna see it, right? Like forget, you know, the internet and all that. <laughs> it was somehow gonna cross the border. And when I go to Hollywood, LA to do an audition, they're gonna have seen that, that show and they're not gonna employ me based on that performance. Man, what a, you know, <laughs> what an outrageous, vivid, um, you know, imagination. <laughs> Did a great job with Belle. Well, now that the splinter has been removed and the area is clean and dressed, everything's set to heal. Thanks, Dr. George. All decks, this is the captain speaking. Evacuate the ship immediately. Get your down. shuttle craft. Repeat evacuate. This is George's voice. What's happening? I got called into JJ Abrams' office and um, there was no information about what it was for. I knew it was for Star Trek, but I didn't know what character or anything. And it was basically based on an audition I had had for the lead role that who Chris Pine had played 12 months prior. And um, I don't know how they'd sifted through it and thought, oh, he looks a bit similar, let's get him in. So I came in, he handed me the script and I just read through the scene, that initial scene. and. Um, did something right, I don't know. I remember not really understanding what I was a part of potentially, which was a good thing. If I had known it was gonna be the relaunching of Star Trek and become the film it became, I'm sure I would have been a lot more intimidated, but I auditioned on the Friday or had that interaction on the Friday and then was shooting on the Monday. So there wasn't a whole lot of time for me to process what it was. You know, there's something that happens with young actors and you see it with, with children all the time there's just such an honesty and a purity to how they perform before anyone gets involved. And I think that a bit about that experience and, and, and a lot of things earlier in my career when you were just exploring, you know, there was a freedom to that because I didn't have a lot of time to, to imagine a backstory or prep it. It was just sort of like, hey, you're in this situation, how would you react? What emotion can you, can you pour into this? And I feel like often at times I'm, I'm trying to get back to that space. There's a loss of that initial sort of spontaneity that might come earlier in your career. There was talk about me doing the film with Chris Pine at one point, the script was sort of put together and then it fell apart. And if JJ Abrams called me tomorrow and said, Chris Pine and I want to do it, I'd, I'd probably say, yeah, let, let's go for it. Let's name him after your dad, let's call him Jim. I'd shot Star Trek, and then I had about eight or nine months where I couldn't get a job. Um, and then the film came out, and it gave me some momentum. And I had auditioned for Thor a few times, didn't get a call back. I then had the opportunity to have another call back, 
Star Trek had come out, Kenneth Branagh had seen it. I do think it, it helped in many, many ways. And I think J.J. Abrams and Kenneth had a conversation. The initial audition I sent, or the, or the tape, was with my mum and I, and my mum was reading as Anthony Hopkins. So I don't know, maybe it was her read that somehow influenced the, or swayed the vote there. It's unwise to be in my company right now, brother. This was to be my day of triumph. It'll come. This was like a three day period where we both got flown out just outside of London, and this beautiful farm, homestead environment. You know, we were all in Kenneth Branagh's pool and having a swim and talking, and Tom and I were chatting, just going, wow, I think this is going to be pretty special. And there he and I were, two young actors, going, wow, this is it. This could be our, our big shot. This could be our big moment. And yeah, it was really, it did. That, and that's what it was. It, that's where it launched both of our careers. And I think back to that moment and that time period a lot, just about the, the uncertainty, the unknown, the possibilities, all of it was so fresh and exciting and, 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 and wonderful. It, it, one of the most vivid memories I have of realizing, wow, that I think this is gonna work, was at Comic-Con. And there were two or 3,000 people in the room and they played the teaser trailer. And at the end of it, the crowd erupted and they're on screaming and cheering and so on. And, and I really, at that moment went, oh wow, I think this is gonna work. You know, there, there was so much effort and hard work and, and anxiety about what we're doing and are the fans gonna be happy? Are people gonna see it? Are people gonna want to see this film? To get that response and that immediate response from an audience, which, um, you know, being in front of the camera with the crew, you don't, you don't get that. You know, if you do theater or you're playing in a stadium or whatever, you feel that, you know, we hadn't experienced that yet. Are these your chambers? Uh, it's more of a temporary living situation. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't usually have guests. Actually, um, I never have guests. <laughs> hey, what is that? What? In the lake, right there. Oh, come on. Oh, guys, I'm serious, right there. There, there. God, it looks just like my girlfriend. What? <laughs> <laughs> I remember understanding what the archetype of the character was. He was, he was the jock, essentially. And... I thought, okay, cool. I know what that looks like. I know how to inhabit that space. And then there was, I think, some improvisation there done, but also we had a script. And it was more about taking direction from Drew Goddard. And I think he wanted to see, can I ask you to do X, Y, Z? Can you follow those instructions, da, 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 And are you collaborative and whatever? And I just hit it off with him in the room. And we, we had a great discussion about the character, about why this individual may be this way, what's his experiences, etc. And we tried the scene in a number of different ways and just an incredible storyteller. One of my favorite writers at the time, just you could see the creativity pouring out of him, the excitement he has about the world, the excitement he had about the, you know, the, the, this character and, and the places we we're gonna explore. The, the enthusiasm I remember very vividly it struck me about him and I thought this guy is going to be a lot of fun and he certainly knows where his sort of creative compass is pointing. <laughs> I'm coming back with cops and choppers and large fucking guns and those things are going to pay for jewels. Oh, I think the racetrack telephoned ahead that I was coming. Hunt, James Hunt. I really wanted to work with Ron Howard. I started to do some research about the world and this character and immediately just fell in love with it. I think Ron Howard's first response was, oh, the guy from Thor, you know, he's not, he's, he's not right. And, um, which was understandable because I was, you know, 220 pounds in that film and then for a race car driver, I needed to be probably 185 pounds. By the time I had done this tape, I had lost a bit of weight, but knew I could lose more. I think he said something about the accent and um, the charisma and the cheekiness came through. Uh, and then that was kind of the, the, the guiding light for the character for me. There was a sort of a youthfulness to him, which, um, which I had to sort of tap into and, and, and stick with. It's great because it's about the un unpredictable nature. I think that's the most exciting stuff to watch on screen. It's often the most exciting characteristics that someone can have in real life where you interact with. You know, it's exciting to watch. You don't know 
what they're going to do next is something very spontaneous and fun about that. And that, yeah, I guess that's what I meant by not being able to pin him down in one sentence because he was many different things on many different days. And that, again, just allowed us to have a very rich, layered character that wasn't two-dimensional or expected. What are you talking about? You did it! Did what? <laughs> You're crazy, bastard! You came third! You got the points! You're champion of the world! James Hunt! As first mate. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mason, you, you promised me command of a ship after my last voyage when I brought you back 1,500 barrels. Do you remember? You gave me your word. I think because Rush was something I was so proud of and he'd been able to pull out a performance of me that I hadn't done elsewhere, I wanted that opportunity again because of the collaboration and when I handed in the script and his response was, wow, I love it, I'd love to do it, obviously, and off we went. If someone of his level and talent and experience sees something in it, then, then let's go for it. And again, very different world, very different character than I'd inhabited before. You know, that's what it's about. It's about kind of pushing yourself in different directions, taking risks, uh, not repeating the same thing over and over, and this was you know, a vehicle for that. I think that the, the real kind of final ingredient that was right between action and card or right before action is Ron will throw me an idea or ask a question of me, and I don't have to answer it right there. I'll just roll camera and I allow that to come to the surface of the, you know, the interpretation of the character. Um, and that's all great directors. They, they, they ask questions of you to force you to think deeper and look at it in a different way, as opposed to saying, this is the answer, this is what it is. Because then you're kind of puppeteering to an extent, or you're, um, you're trying to hit someone else's target, as opposed to it being a truthful expression of your own experience. It's clear that full disclosure will have ramifications, terrible ramifications for the whole industry that a whale brought down the Essex. But it's the truth. Hey, hey, we know each other. He's a friend from work. I wasn't stoked with what I'd done in Thor 2. You know, I, I was a little disappointed in what I'd done. I didn't think I, I grew the character in any way. I didn't think I showed an audience something unexpected and different. And, and then when Ragnarok came along, out of my own sort of frustration of what I had done, and this is not on any other director or anyone, this is my own performance, I really wanted to break the mold. And I said this to Tyker, and I think the conversation we had was, I said, oh, I'm really bored of Thor. And he said, yeah, I'm really bored of Thor too. <laughs> and then we decided not to be bored. And any time that, 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 that feeling came into play, we'd go in a different direction. And so, we just dismantled the character. We wanted to have him be a little more unpredictable. We wanted him to, um, to be in a different set of circumstances than he'd been in before. And also have the humor come through. You know, there was, I had a great relationship with Taika and we had a great sense of humor and banter with us. And, and I thought, let's, let's make sure we cram that into this space. And the character he played of Korg then was there. So it was kind of a lot of it was him and I improvising and him and I as our most truthful version of ourselves. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Korg. I'm kind of like the leader in here. I'm made of rocks, as you can see, but don't let that intimidate you. You don't need to be afraid unless you're made of scissors. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work. You know, you have to keep kind of reining yourself in and bring it back to the truth of the moment and what is it. Does this serve the greater story, not just this individual gag or this individual joke? And that's a real trapping, I find, with improvisation especially in the sort of comedic spaces, you just get caught in sort of doing skits <laughs> and they can be really funny and everyone can laugh on set. And then you watch it in its entirety with, with, with the film and you go, oh, it's, it's funny, but what, what, what are we saying? What's the purpose? What, what emotion is it driving ultimately? You have to take risks. You don't know that as you're doing it. And, and some of it works, some of it doesn't. But I find it incredibly freeing. I find um, you're able to sort of shake out all the creases and and it just becomes a lot more fluid than when there's a, a back and forth between you especially when it works you know when you, you and other actors are in in sync and there is a sort of beautiful sort of bat and ball game <laughs> occurring you know i just love playing the character i love the journey i've been on with him not only as thor but just my life the sort of two have been side by side for 10 11 years now and and uh and have both crossed over into each other's world 
from time to time. Being able to work with Tyker again, you know, I don't know that I would have done another one if Tyker hadn't said yes, he was going to do it. And he had written this beautiful script, uh, which was a wacky, crazy, romantic comedy set in space. And that I hadn't seen before. <laughs> and I thought, cool, I have a way into this. And uh, it sounds like a lot of fun. You're Banner's friend. I'm not Banner's friend, I prefer you. Banner's friend. I don't even like Banner. I'm into numbers and science and stuff. <laughs> so I'm guessing you're Father Flynn, which makes a dead guy Laramie Seymour Sullivan. And you, miss, must be Darlene Sweet. Hmm? That was a really interesting one. I think I said yes to that before I'd even read the script based on my relationship to Drew Goddard and my love of his storytelling. There was a lot of sort of danger and un unpredictable nature to the character, but a very twisted individual too. And trying to dissect that and understand, well, okay, how does he get to this place? What is, what are the experiences that have come before? And what is it that he's trying to achieve? What is it based on? And then so much of that guy was ego. Everything was sort of sexualized and everything was about control and dominance and, and very sort of awful sort of traits. Amazing script and dialogue that we were able to use and chew into and, and you know, everything he was doing was about intimidation and he's trying to dissect information, but it's very manipulative and it was kind of fun, you know. I'd like to think I, I speak for everyone, you know, on the set. We were kind of laughing in between takes going, this guy is a narcissistic creep. It was just, you know, this is what's fun about playing characters. You, you get to dress up as an individual and, and do some strange and odd things which don't hold sort of consequence, you know, and, and he was sick and twisted and so on, but there wasn't anything that went too far into the realm of something that I might have carried home with me. I think the energy of the character I would carry a bit with me. There, there was a sort of frenetic sort of um, unsettling vibe to him, which I definitely would have to shake out at the end of the day. And even when, you know, running the lines and rehearsing, it was like, oh, there's a real twisted sort of tension here, which is which was um, interesting to tap into. I was shooting in Vancouver and my wife was back in Australia, so she didn't have to look at me too often, which was probably a good thing. <laughs> really? Where's a, where's a girl like you get all this kind of money from, huh? I earned it. Singing. You like that word, but no, I mean, how attractive is she? Why, see, can't see through yourself. Heather, can you shut up, please? I'm asking Jeff. Jeff, how's she looking? Come on. Man. Scale of one to ten. The appeal was something I hadn't done before, a world I hadn't been a part of. And this script was new and fresh and unique. And I saw a way into the individual that um, I don't think initially was on the page. I, I, I saw something else there. I saw a very manipulative charisma that he would use to his advantage to um, move the pieces of the puzzle on the chessboard to achieve whatever he wanted to achieve. And he was sort of a mastermind of that. Highly intelligent, but inability to really feel empathy, I think, but also enough intelligence to understand he might be missing that component in his emotional makeup. And that was really fun to play with because it made for a very dangerous character. You're not sure what he's gonna do next and he's doing it with a smile. I wanted there to be an intrigue with the character and an interest, but also a danger. And it was very much like a play and very refreshing for me coming off, you know, either extraction full of action or Thor full of action and special effects and so on and big heavy costumes. This was like casual sort of outfit, just you and the actor or the actress and the crew, and, and, and that was it. You know, it was a very sort of collaborative family setting. I think I was, for a lot of the films I've done, trying to work out what an audience wanted and do they want to see me in this or that. I've now just tried to simplify it and go, does this speak to me in some way? Do I have something to say as this character? And will it be an enjoyable experience and one that you know, if I'm going to be away from my family and my kids, you know, it better be worth it. And just keep it in that space, you know, not get too caught up in the sort of the larger orchestration of it. Um, because then it takes it away from the sort of creative 
journey and I think some of the purity is lost in that sense. So just, just keep it simple.